Hello, welcome to ECTV. I'm Jade Spur. And I'm Zion Reza. On today's show, we will be visiting Social Awareness Night, an event held by El Camino High School at Ventura College. We will be discussing the history of class in America and have an inspirational interview with Maricela Morales. We will be joining Ethan Massacre at the Wright Event Center, where the Social Awareness Night is being held. Once there, we will talk about the significance of the event and what the people at the event thought about it. Hi, I'm Ethan Messaker, here at the Ventura College campus where students, their parents, and the community are getting together to discuss important issues. It's an event held by El Camino High School uh, to get young people to just kind of speak about issues that are important to them. And the idea was to bring together students and parents and share and talk about issues that matter. Uh, the Social Awareness Night is a chance for our community to come together and open up and share new ideas and gain new insight into our fellow citizens and fellow students. Given the state of current political discourse, we found these discussions to be refreshingly civil. We talked about immigration, gun control, uh, education reform, and racial issues in America. Tonight's topics uh, definitely cover uh, subjects and items that affect us directly and affect the people that surround us. But I think it's really important to uh, learn how to think clearly and critically about complicated issues. That's, that's life. This event was organized by El Camino High School and put together by students hoping to create a forum to discuss concerns we all have. Well, these discussions promote progress and they promote uh, social awareness in a way that really has a positive impact on our culture and our community. Because we brought together uh, parents, a different a, a generation removed, and students. And I think having parents hear their sons or daughters speak so um, intelligently and uh, uh, um, articulately about things that matter. Towards the end of the night, we could see that everyone had something important to say, and all opinions were respected. The best way to cause change on issues that you care about are to discuss them. Uh, information and education are the first steps to making big change. It helps me see how important um, it is for students to have a voice, and when they do, the amazing ideas and, and um, solutions and knowledge they, they can bring to, to real problems. This event brought people together to talk about things that we don't usually talk about in a civil way. I think that's something we could all appreciate and hope to continue in the future. And now, let's go back to the studio. That was very inspiring and motivating to witness teens and adults come together and talk about such important political topics. Now, we will be joining Grace in the studio with Michael Ward, a professor at Ventura College. They will be discussing the important and pressing topic regarding the history of class. Hello, my name is Grace Johnson Glick, and I'm joined today by Michael Ward, a Ventura College history professor. We will be discussing the history behind classism. All right, could you actually give me a little bit more on your background as a history professor? Well, I, uh, my background as a professor, uh, I've taught in a, uh, a number of different places and, in, and for different audiences for probably 30 years. Um, I've taught history in higher education yeah. for only the last uh, about 16, 17 years. Um, his, uh, uh, as a, as a, a lecturer or professor of history at, at different campuses, I'm um, a full-time professor of history at Ventura College and the department chair yeah. as well. I, I still um, remain a lecturer teaching a class sometimes to it. Cal State University Northridge, mm -hmm. um, but that's yeah, that's my background. My background in history is ranges from <laughs> social and economic history. All right, um, I'm going to start really with a heavy hitter. Do you okay. think class exists? Indeed, it does. It does. Okay. Um, could you actually define our current class system? Like, how are we structured in America? Well, our our class structures today uh, were born out of the. Um, efficiency of, of 
market capitalism yeah. in the post-War of 1812 period in this country, uh, as a number of historians have identified. And, and that definition differs from the earlier colonial period um, uh, in that we have a, a, a large working class uh, that's part of the lower class uh, and, a, and a, a different times of our history, a fluctuating middle class. Yeah. Uh, the end, and then a, a very small upper class. And the definitions of each uh, are typical of, of how economic historians have defined them and sociologists and anthropologists as well uh, for, for at least the Atlantic world. Yeah. Uh, but much of those definitions apply to the whole globe today. So who actually like benefits currently from a class system? like? The upper class, or yeah. do you think it's like a whole? It, it, it depends when we're talking about. You know, in the post World War II environment, where uh, the upper class was taxed uh, sufficiently, um, you have government um, kind of the post new continuation of the New Deal, and then through the uh, middle military industrial complex uh, uh, spending, which also created jobs, but the GI Bill, a number of. Um, um, heavy spending in education in particular. Yeah. Uh, you have the development, uh, the growth of the middle class to, to uh, levels that we never before saw. And in, in that time, and again, it, it depended on, on healthy structures of wealth redistribution to make that happen, appropriate taxation of corporations and yeah. uh, appropriate taxation of the upper class um, in order to make that happen. And so you have a window of time from the late 1940s through the late 1970s when, when that occurred. And that's, in that sense, everybody benefited uh, for the most part. That being said, there are people of uh, non-whites who didn't benefit from it largely. And that's another aspect of that story yeah. that's, that's often discussed. You know, so there's like class within right. class. Of course there are, yeah. And then um, in the, in the post-late 1970s period, or the mid to late 1970s, um, the shift of the tax burden has gone from the top to the middle. And when that happened, the benefits went to the top. Yeah. And, and it wasn't just the U.S. that did that. This has been a global phenomenon, uh, especially in the Atlantic world, especially the U.S., Canada, uh, other parts of the Americas and Europe. And what's happened since then is, is a dramatic wealth disparity. Uh, as Oxfam defines every January in its report, um, and we've reached unprecedented levels of class disparity and wealth disparity uh, yeah. in the world today. And of course, the outcomes of that historically are that it, it leads to rebellion, it leads to revolution, it leads to violence. And all, almost all the violence in the world that we see today um, when you look at the roots underneath, it's, it's usually, it's, it has to do with poverty, has to do with a lack of opportunities, has to do with, with wealth disparity. Yeah. You actually mentioned the middle class earlier. It seems mm -hmm. like all that we talk about the middle class now is that it's disappearing. Like, why do you mm -hmm. think that is? Well, because, because the, the uh, structures to sustain it um, through lucrative jobs. I mean, maybe we should define the middle class first. I mean, the middle class is, is a consuming class, it's also a producing class, but, but the kinds of production it's engaged in are always in support of the, uh, at least in the modern era, of capitalist or industrial capitalist stru uh, 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 structures. Or, uh, in other words, um, you have professional jobs are typical, typically middle class jobs. Uh, lawyers, MDs, um, uh, college professors, teachers, um, accountants. I mean, these are all middle class professions. And they support the broader society and the structures in place that, um, uh, you know, that that's support the whole, but in our history have always supported the, the people at the top. And, and um, as long as the society and there's enough flow back and forth and, and, uh, and it's the tax uh, structures are, are, are fair enough and equal enough and there's enough redistribution yeah. of, of wealth along the way. Everybody benefits. Um, yeah. 
but that doesn't seem to be happening. Like most recently, no. what comes to my mind is actually Occupy Wall Street, yeah. which was this movement that was like against the one percent mm -hmm. essentially. But it just seemed to peter out really quickly. So my question really is, how do you get a movement going? Like what can make a change in a class system? Well, it takes community organizing. Um, I mentioned to you Kent Wong earlier from the UCLA Labor Center who, who, um, who told me a few years back when I was organizing faculty at another campus yeah. uh, that uh, it's essential in any organizing effort to, conv to somehow get the community where you're organizing yeah. to wake up to the fact that whatever it is you're trying to draw attention to, then it benefits them. Uh, Wall Street, that's kind of a, a, big, a, a big topic. Yeah. And there are different levels around which you have to organize, certainly on national and state levels, but also on community levels. And I, I think too often we, we don't see our connection individually to where the source of the problem is. And so it takes community organizing, and that's always been the case. Every big movement we've had from the colonial period to the present uh, involved very active community organizing so that the communities, the people in the, in the suburbs, in the, in the downtown, inner city areas, everybody un relates to the source of the problem and, and the activists who are involved with organizing. Yeah. And that's essential. So with, your, with, with regard to Wall Street and, and uh, what happened there, the 1%, I mean, it was a brilliant concept, but it was kind of a flash in the pan. It kind of yeah. It, it appeared and, and it couldn't be sustainable. Yeah, I think it could have been sustained, but but uh, and I don't. There are a number of studies that have run into the, that have looked at that, um, but there was also a reaction from Wall Street to try to shut it down very quickly as well, and from the media, which uh, more often than not is controlled by corporations that have a stake in Wall Street, and and um, and then the nature of the organizing, the electronic media, yeah. is such that it's kind of you know it's very ephemeral. Right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> That's all the time okay. we have today. Uh, well, thank you for, for joining us. us. Thank you for having me. I'm glad we got to cover such an interesting topic. Now we will be going back to the Social Awareness Night coverage, where Sumaya will be interviewing Marcella Morales. Hello, everyone, and welcome to ECTV. My name is Sumaya Islam, and today I am here with Marcella Morales at El Camino High School Social Awareness event, where we will be talking about her life and work. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for the invitation. So can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I was born in California and uh, grew up in Fillmore here in Ventura County. My parents are from Mexico, uh, working class. Uh, they both had about a junior high education. Mm -hmm. uh, I and my brother and sister are the first to go on to college. I attended uh, Stanford University and uh, was pre-med at the time. Uh, I had started volunteering with my first paid internship when I was 14, working at a community clinic because I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, worked part-time my senior year in high school as a certified nursing assistant. And so when I went to Stanford, um, you know, I, I was continuing my dream of becoming a doctor. But through all my studies and my volunteer work, I realized that that's not how I wanted to work with people. And so after graduation, I did a year of volunteer service with homeless and runaway teens. And from there, I started my work in nonprofit. And um, I now work as executive director of CAUSE, and we promote social, economic, and environmental justice here in Ventura County. And what was it like being the daughter of, an, of immigrants? It was um, both special and challenging. Mm -hmm. um, I c certainly felt from the time that um, I was five years old that when I walked out of my front door, I was walking into um, what felt like a foreign place. Okay. Um, at home, we spoke Spanish. And um, when I went to school, um, uh, you know, my first year, I didn't understand English. And so I remember my kindergarten year um, without any sound mm -hmm. because I didn't understand what was being said. Um, once I learned English, then you know I remember voices. Um, my my first experience was troubling of of learning that I was Mexican. Um, I was seven years old and I was walking home from school, and um, um, 
uh, a little young uh, white boy um, came up to me as I was walking home and um, stood in front of my face and spit uh, in my face and uh, called me a dirty Mexican. Uh, up until that point, I didn't realize I was Mexican. Uh, I realized that I was, you know, different. Um, and so growing up um, Mexican-American, um, uh, was definitely aware that I was um, different and that even though I was born here, um, that I wasn't considered uh, to be American. And so that experience um, of growing up in an immigrant family has definitely shaped my life. And is that why you wanted to make a difference? I wanted to make a difference um, and always have from the time I was a child uh, because I care about people. Mm -hmm. And um, I think also since I was a child, I've always sensed uh, innately that uh, we all matter. Right. And um, from you know, the time that, that I could, I wanted to um, help people. And, um, and when I realized that certain groups of people um, are left on the margins, mm -hmm. uh, certain pe uh, groups of people tend to be poor, Certain groups of people tend to live in areas that are unhealthy. Mm -hmm. um, then that's where my sense of, of justice came forth in that I believe everyone should uh, live in safety and in a healthy community that nurtures them and that allows them to uh, be fully who they are. And that when everyone lives in an environment like that, we all prosper because then we all get to really fulfill our potential and contribute uh, to the world. And so we're all better off for it. So I think it makes sense. Very well said. And how did you get involved with government? <sighs> with government. Mm -hmm. um, when I was working, first working at CAUSE, I was working with the community and we're, we're looking at um, who represents that community looking at school board members, looking at city council members, and on up. And in that exercise, we saw that there was very little uh, women, very few women mm -hmm. in elected office, and very few people of color, uh, Latinos, African American, uh, any other ethnicity really than white. And um, at that time, there was an opening in uh, city council, and I really saw it as a call to service that I was in a position to be able to step into that role and that it was about another way to give back to the community by bringing in uh, a, a new voice and a different experience uh, to be responsive to a broader um, segment of the community. Mm -hmm. So give us a little rundown of the work you are currently involved with. So right now at CAUSE, uh, we are doing very many things. It's all under the umbrella of social, economic, and environmental justice. Okay. So one of the things that we are working on is we want to increase wages for working families. Mm -hmm. The minimum wage is what we call a poverty wage. Uh, if you're working full time, you would earn about $20,000 a year. Okay. That is not enough to pay for rent, childcare, transportation, um, food. Right. And so um, we need to increase the minimum wage. So at CAUSE, we're going to be working with many partners to um, get a state law passed this year in November mm -hmm. to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. The other thing that we're working on is what we call healthy communities. Mm -hmm. There is um, the threat of a fourth power plant, fossil fuel power plant in Oxnard. And um, we are fighting to uh, stop that fourth power plant. In the advent of climate change mm -hmm. and knowing that um, poor communities have to deal more with power plants, uh, we want to stop this fourth power plant. And so working with community, we are um, doing that work to try to prevent a fourth fossil fuel power plant locally. Okay. And uh, the other thing that, that we're doing is that we are um, going to be working to bring in more funding for public schools. Oh, wow. There's going to be also another ballot measure in November uh, that will um, uh, secure uh, you know, more public funding for schools. And we need that for public education. Um, to, to make our community stronger. Okay. 
And to talk more into agriculture, mm -hmm. um, how important is agriculture to Ventura County? Yes, so agriculture is really important to Ventura County. It's important to the world. Um, in terms of Ventura County, agriculture specifically, mm -hmm. Ventura County is about number seven in the state in terms of counties, in terms of how much they produce. Okay. So we produce enough fruits and vegetables here that they are exported um, to other states and uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. So it's important to Ventura County, it's important to the world. We eat from what is grown here. Um, there's, we produce about uh, $2 billion worth Mm -hmm. of fruits and vegetables here in Ventura County. Wow. So it is very important to um, the economy of Ventura County. Okay, and what is the monetary value of agriculture in Ventura County? Uh, just a little bit over $2 billion. All right. And how many farm workers would you say we have in Ventura County? I'm glad that you ask about farm workers mm -hmm. because uh, often, too often, we don't think about farm workers. Mm -hmm. uh, we think about farms, we, we think about um, farmers, but it's uh, farm workers right. who do the, the toughest labor okay. um, to bring us fruits and vegetables to our table. Um, there are about 26,000 farm workers in Ventura County, mm -hmm. and uh, they do the back-breaking work um, literally back-breaking right. work, um, bent over for eight, ten hours a day, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the weather. And, um, you know, few people know that um, second to firefighters, farm workers are um, the second um, workforce uh, to um, die of uh, heat illness um, because they are exposed to, to those conditions. It's terrible. Uh, so they contribute and they earn poverty wages. And so we, we want to address that here in Ventura County. Okay, and my final question for you is, how and why should the youth sitting in this very room tonight get involved? So I'll start with the why. Okay. Um, and I'll give several answers because different things move us. Mm -hmm. um, one is uh, hopefully that youth would be inspired, mm -hmm. uh, inspired to make a difference. That um, you know we can um, not only change our own lives by what we do, but we can literally help make a better world okay. by what we do. So I would hope that youth would be inspired to work with others, um, not only other youth but adults. Mm -hmm. um, that together, right, we can create a better world. Right. Um, another reason, uh, though, is, um, you know, youth, um, thinking back to when I was one, uh, you know, we like our autonomy, right? We're, we're starting to explore that. Um, we want to be on our own, uh, make decisions for ourselves, right? Exactly. Well, um, getting involved in the community, uh, is a way, uh, to make decisions, mm -hmm. um, for, for yourself, um, in community. And, if, um, for instance, if you don't vote, you're letting somebody else make decisions for you. Mm -hmm. So if you have a sense of autonomy, right, of I want to um, be part of the decisions that are made that impact my life and that impact the, you know, many others, mm -hmm. then I'm going to get involved in, in, in community. So those are two reasons why, okay. right? Inspiration, hopefully, right. Uh, making a, a, a better world. Um, or that sense of, hey, decisions are being made that impact my life. I want to be part of those decisions. Right. So those are two, two reasons. Um, and how? So uh, if you're 18, uh, mm -hmm. you can register to vote. You just have to be 18 and a citizen, mm -hmm. and you can vote. And every vote does matter. There have been decisions here locally that have been decided literally by one vote. Wow. So they do matter. Um, so that's one way. Another way is to um, you know, look online, um, look for issues that you're interested in, and you will find an organization mm -hmm. that is working on that issue. Get involved with that organization, because for as much change as we can make individually, the change is, grows exponentially when we do it with an organization, with a group of people. True. Well, thank you so much for being here with us and for your inspiring words. Thank you.
Thank you, Samaya, for interviewing such a great person at a much needed event. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed our show and join us next time on ECTV.